Um, so the Bible is God's word. Um, but as a book, it's a book made out of many, many books, and it's written by many, many people um, over a long period of time. Um, and where we're reading from, um, we're reading a, about Jesus, but Jesus didn't write any of the books. But all of these books still point towards Jesus in one way or another. Um, so we're reading from Luke chapter 7. Luke is in a New Testament, and Luke is the person who wrote it. This is the gospel according to Luke, and he's writing to someone, and he's collected uh, all these eyewitnesses' accounts of what Jesus said and did, and he's you know researched and he's put it together so he can tell people well, who was Jesus. So Luke chapter 7, when you're ready, um, let's read. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And she stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put on oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Thanks, Hannah. My name's Josh. I'm the lead pastor of Laneway Church. I'm really glad you're here today. We asked Melbourne and Mel people answered, who is Jesus? Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is a prophet. And uh, I'm going to click this and see if something happens. And if it doesn't, we'll see what happens. Now, at the end of this, I'd love for you to have a chance to ask questions. So there's a number that's going to be on the screen a few times throughout the talk. Put that on your phone now and keep your Bible open at Luke chapter 7 as we look at this together. Now, about nine years ago, I was part of a Bible study group that was full of uh, two kind of groups of people. Uh, half of us were born in Australia, and the other half of us were born in Iran. Uh, for those who were born in Iran, uh, all of them had grown up in Muslim families and uh, had uh, been following uh, the ways of Islam, and all of them liked Jesus as Muslims. 
And perhaps that's you this morning. You're here, you're visiting, your friends invited you, uh, you're a Muslim, and you really like Jesus. Um, I understand that. I was reading the Quran and what it had to say about Jesus, and I could, I could see there, there's lots of wonderful things to like about him. I imagine that the people that answered Jesus is a prophet, most of them are like you and have grown up knowing about Jesus through reading the Quran and, uh, and going to the mosque. I'll say in, in that group that I was part of, as we would read the Bible together, my uh, friends from Iran who were Muslims said that they had each gone through a big change in their life where they'd gone from someone who liked Jesus, believing that he was a prophet, to being people who loved Jesus, loved him. And my hope is that this morning each one of us would move from liking Jesus to loving him, from wherever we've come from, whatever our background, as we look at who Jesus is. Now, here's where I want to go with you. First, I want to uh, jump into the Bible with you together and see, is Jesus actually a prophet? Now, as we explore that, I'm going to say the answer is yes, just to flag that up front, yes. That's actually going to raise a significant issue for us that we're going to look at through this passage in Luke chapter 7. So have your Bibles open there. Well, let's get into it. Is uh, so we asked you answer. Jesus is a prophet. Is that the case? Yes, yes. What is a prophet? Well, a prophet is a messenger from God. There's one who speaks the words of God with the authority of God. Now, it might surprise you if you've come from a kind of non-religious family and you've walked in this morning to hear that the number one answer people gave who is Jesus, was actually something that spoke to their being a God and that this God makes himself known through chosen people. That might surprise you. In fact, in where we live around us, I think many people, perhaps even most people, believe there is a God and believe that he speaks. Now on the screen you can see a passage written in the Quran So this is written 550 years after Jesus lived. In in it, it says that Jesus is a prophet. So this is an English translation. Um, An angel is speaking to Mary from Surah 3. When the angel said, O Mary, your Lord gives you good news of a word from him. His name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, honored in this world and in the next, and one of those who are granted nearness to God. God will instruct him in the book and in wisdom and in the Torah and in the gospel. He'll make him a messenger to the children of Israel. So what is a prophet? A prophet is a messenger from God, one who comes from him, who speaks the words of God with God's authority. Now, as a Christian, what do I believe? Well, I believe that Jesus is a prophet. Yes, he is. How do we know that? Like, How do we know that there is a God, that he speaks, and that he speaks through Jesus? Well, uh, in the Bible, as you come to read about Jesus, you see three big things. You see his teaching his miracles, and his prediction. So Jesus taught as one who has the authority of God. It was constantly amazing people with the way that he taught. In Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 21 to 28, Jesus is in a synagogue in Capernaum. He goes in on the Sabbath and begins to teach. And as people listen to him, they are shocked with what they're hearing. This guy teaches with authority, not as the teachers of the law. And you can imagine them there. So if I was Jesus, you're listening to Jesus. He's speaking. Your jaw is on the floor. You can't believe the way this man speaks. But then in our midst, something crazy happens. A man who's possessed by an unclean spirit stands up and starts raving. He cries out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. What does Jesus do? He speaks again. Be quiet. Come out of him. This impure spirit shakes the man violently, comes out of him with a shriek. What do people do in reaction? They're amazed. We would be amazed. And to hear what they say, what is this? And they're not so amazed at the casting out of the demon. What are they amazed at? The authority of Jesus' words. A new teaching with authority. And the power of his teaching 
is demonstrated in the power of his words to cast out an evil spirit. He taught like no one else. And he performed miracles, signs from God, like the Old Testament prophets Moses and Elijah. If you've got your Bible open there, look back in chapter 7 at verse 11. Just before the moment Jesus went to a meal at the Pharisee's house, in verse 11, he meets a widow whose son has died. As the widow goes out of the town of Nain with her, Her dead son, in a large crowd, Jesus meets them. His heart goes out to her. And walking up, he touches the beer that they're carrying the man on. Everyone stands still and he speaks. Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up, began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Again, everyone is amazed. They're shocked. What is going on here? What do they make of Jesus? Well, do you see what they say? Luke chapter 7, verse 16. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. Here is a prophet like Moses, like Elijah. God has come to help his people. But the great test of a prophet is this. It's not just his teaching, not just his miracles, but does the things he say that will happen, actually happen. And if he says this is going to happen in the future and it doesn't happen, you can be sure this man is not from God. So what was the big thing Jesus said would happen? Well, it was this. He said he would die. Again and again, he said this. Right after the moment his disciples finally work out who he is, realizing that he is God's chosen one, the Christ, He says this to them. So he's with them in Caesarea Philippi. He asks his disciples, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you're the Messiah. Jesus warns them not to tell anyone about him. And then he begins to teach them. What does the prophet, the Christ, teach his followers? It's this. He must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. He must be killed and after three days rise again. This was his great teaching. This was his great prediction. He would be rejected, be crucified, and on the third day raised from the dead. And if that happened, then he truly was from God. Now I'm really convinced Jesus is a prophet. And more than a prophet. And uh, as, a, as a church, we often interview people up the front asking them, you know, how'd you come to know Jesus? Why did you start to trust him? And why do you still follow him? And the most frequent answer people give to the why do you still follow him is this. They say Peter's words in another part of the Bible. Where else would I go? Jesus alone has words of eternal life. I don't know about about you. If you're a Christian here, maybe that's, that's exactly how you'd answer it as well. Why do you still follow Jesus? That's it for me. Where else would I go? This man has words of eternal life. When I listen to him, when I see his miracles, when I see that what he said would happen, happens, I'm willing to stake my life on him. Where else would I go? He has words of eternal life. But this does raise an issue. This raises an issue. Because when we start to listen carefully to what Jesus says, not just what we think he might say, not just what Christmas cards say he said, when we actually start to listen, when we actually see what he does, it raises an issue because he actually expects something. He expects that if we accept that he is a prophet, that we would not only listen to him, but we would also love him. We would not only listen to him, we would also love him greatly. And so if you're here and you're a Muslim, or you're here and you're a seeker, Buddhist, atheist, you're exploring who Jesus is, if he's a prophet, will you listen to him? If you listen to him, do you love him? Now, coming to this passage in Luke chapter 7, 
Because in this passage that we've read, we've met a man who doubts that Jesus is a prophet. So Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 36. If you don't have a Bible with you, just grab one off the tables around you. Ask a friend to pass it to you or grab it on your phone. Very helpful for you to follow along. The person next to you can help you find the passage. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Uh, in this passage, to understand this, we need to watch the woman, we need to understand Simon, and we need to listen to Jesus. So first, watch the woman. Uh, Luke, the writer, he draws our attention to her in verse 37. Look, he says, a woman. And then the Pharisee looks at her, and when he sees this, we hear, and then Jesus himself points her out to Simon and to us. Do you see this woman? So you have to give her your attention. Okay, what do you see? Verse 36. Let's read, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. Do you see this woman? We're introduced to her. She is a sinner in the town. That means she has a reputation. I mean, you might need to think back to high school. Was there a girl in your school who had that reputation? You know, the whole school thought about her. She had that reputation, the sinner. This woman, if you like, that's her grown up. This is where her life's taken. She's got a reputation in the whole town, the city. That's how widely known she is. And what does she do? Her behavior is kind of shameful. This shameful woman does a shameful thing. She walks into this religious teacher's house where she's not invited. And then she walks up to the guest of honor and she stands right beside his feet. And then she begins weeping. And as she weeps, she's crying so heavily that the tears run off her cheeks and onto his feet. His feet are getting wet. And then she lets her hair down and gets down on her hands and knees at his feet and starts using her hair to wipe his feet wiping off her tears, wiping his feet clean. And then she begins to kiss his feet and takes this expensive perfume and pours it all over his feet. You can imagine the smell in the room. But this woman, this woman who's doing these things, she's a known sinner. She's that woman. Surely she's making Jesus unclean. Surely she's shaming him and the the religious leader whose house she's barged into, touching him in such a way, kissing him. Just imagine if that was you. Imagine if you were the religious leader and that girl from school comes into your house and the the guest that you've wanted to come, this honoured man is there, and she, she walks in and she's weeping and touching him, pouring perfume on him. What do you see when you see this woman at Jesus' feet? Why is she doing these things? You've got to watch the woman. But second, we need to understand Simon, the Pharisee. We need to understand him. What is he thinking? And we get let in to what he's thinking because he says something to himself. Verse 39, what does he think when he watches this woman? Verse 39, when the Pharisee who invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman this is, that she is a sinner. And he forms an opinion, doesn't he? It's not about the woman. Everyone knows about her. His opinion is about Jesus. He cannot be a prophet. Because if he were a prophet, there's no way that he would let a woman like her touch him. Because she is a sinner. 
Do you see? Do you understand his view? Do you, do you understand Simon? He thinks God is holy. His prophet must be holy. His prophet can't be touched by a sinful person because God does not welcome sinners. God welcomes good people. God welcomes faithful people, religious people, Simon thinks. He welcomes people like me. So if this man were a prophet from God, he would know and he would cast this woman aside. Now, that might be your view as you've walked in this morning. God welcomes good people. And sinners he casts aside. That was certainly my grandfather's view, my beloved pa. Uh, after World War II, he received a soldier's settlement, moved into the country of New South Wales, started farming. That's hard. As kids came along, he slipped further and further into alcoholism. He knew he's done so many things. He knew he'd wasted so much money. He knew that he'd messed up his family. That he thought, if I walk into a church building, it will fall down on my head. God welcomes good people. Sinners he casts aside. I wonder if you think that as well. Like Simon. Now, just to go on a tangent for a moment, do you see, Simon doesn't think sin doesn't matter, does he? It's a pretty uh, popular thing to say, I think, right now, sin doesn't matter. There's no such thing really as sin. But that's not Simon's view, and that's not Jesus' view either. Now, you, you might like to think sin doesn't matter, but it doesn't work, does it? I mean, try and tell that to a person who's been the victim of abuse. It's not such a thing as sin. Sin doesn't matter. You say that and you lose everything. It means that nothing can be good either. It's just preferences. It makes God into this monster who doesn't care about what we do. It means there's no hope for justice. Sin does matter. Sin is real. This woman is a sinner, truly. She has a reputation across town. Sin does matter. Now, when we understand Simon, we hear him think our thoughts. God welcomes good people. Sin as he casts aside. But now we have a problem. Because what is Jesus, the prophet, doing, accepting the touch of this woman? Well, here's what we have to do. We have to listen to Jesus. Listen to him. Because he's about to turn everything around. Listen to the two things he teaches. The first is this, the one who has been forgiven much, loves much. Verse 40, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. And Jesus said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, like 500 days wages. The other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Now, just you guys, quick straw poll, okay. Hands up. Who thinks the one who had the 500 cancelled loves him more? All right. Who thinks the one who had the 50? Yeah, you're a pretty intelligent bunch. Congratulations. Simon. He's a pretty intelligent guy too. He goes, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven, right? 500 denarii, 500 days of work to have that debt wiped clean versus you know, a month and a half. Jesus says, yes, Simon, you've judged correctly. Just imagine that for a second. Imagine if someone paid an incredible debt that you owed. Uh, if, if you've grown up in Australia and you've gone to university, you probably have at least that debt. <laughs> if you've come here to study, um, you do it even tougher because you've got to pay everything up front. Maybe your parents have taken out a loan for you to be here. Imagine if someone wiped out a huge debt, the kind of debt that you're going to spend the next 15, 20, perhaps 50 years of your life chipping away at. Imagine if someone just wiped it out, cancelled it, forgave it. 
friends, Jesus is in no way diminishing sin. He describes sin as a big debt, not 50, 500 denarii. Let me help you understand what sin is, right? So often we think sin is the things that we do to each other. Now it is that. It's also the things we fail to do to love each other. But again, it's more than that. It's more than that. Let me tell you a story to try and help with pictures. Imagine a girl. She's smart. She's intelligent. She's caring. She's going places. She starts to be interested in a guy. Now he's a bit of a larrikin. Uh, not so trustworthy. Seems good fun. Her friends, they're not sure. They're like, I don't know about this one. They start dating. He cheats on her. Now he says sorry. She takes him back. But it becomes a pattern for their relationship. He starts borrowing money from her. He says he'll pay her back. But he's just never good for it. They eventually get married. Years go on. Sometimes he's around. He says, I'll change. I'll be better now. I'll do my duty. I'll, I'll, be the, I'll be the husband. I'll be the dad. I'll be present. And he does for a while. But there's never any love. But more often than that, he's away. He's away. He's away. He's away. He's doing his thing. He doesn't come home. Except just after the days she gets paid. Now what do her friends say? What advice do they give to her again and again and again? What do they say? What would you say? Kick this guy out, right? Kick him out. He's using you. He's abusing you. He's taking advantage of your generosity, of your care, your kindness. Kick him out. Friends, that's the way that we treat God. We come to him when we need stuff. We say we'll do better. We try and go through the motions. We do this duty. Shouldn't he kick us out? Don't we treat him like this man treats this woman? Jesus says there is a great debt. Now when the money lender in the parable forgives the debt that's owed, who bears the cost? Who doesn't get the money? The money lender. When Jesus forgives sins, who carries the cost? Jesus does. Not 500 denarii, but our lives. What was the thing he said he must do? He must go to Jerusalem, be rejected, suffer, be crucified. Why? Why was that the point of his life? Why was that the thing he was heading towards? He constantly taught about. It's because there he pays our debt. There he washes us clean, as we sang at the start. Washes us clean from our sins by his blood. We've got this incredible picture, right? This, this woman, this broken, sinful woman, she walks in, and, and there her tears wash Jesus' feet. And with her hair, she wipes them clean. And with her perfume, she makes his feet beautiful. Friends, Jesus has done that for us. Us who trust in him. Not for our feet. Not with his tears. But for our hearts. And with his blood. Our hearts, they're more filthy than any feet. And it's by that death of his on the cross that he cancels our debt and washes us clean makes us holy to god i mean the, the day that you understand jesus that he died on the cross for you that's the day you start loving him there's no cheap forgiveness we've been forgiven much we've been forgiven much And friends, when you grasp it, that's the day you start loving him much. If you are Christians in the room, you're smiling. You're like, yeah, <laughs> it's exactly it. It's exactly it. I was forgiven much. I love him much. That was certainly my path. 
he, he loved to pray. We, over lunch, um, when we would be visiting him, he'd always lead us in prayer and he'd read the Bible with us. Uh, he loved to start his prayers by calling on God as a loving, merciful, gracious, heavenly Father. It's like he couldn't say enough words about how loving, gracious, kind, merciful his God was as he started talking to him. And if you're sitting there going, yeah, I'm, I'm like him. I'm like that woman. Maybe you're, like, you're, not, you're thinking, I'm not quite that woman. I was friends with that. <laughs> I've known her. But you know yourself. You know how you've treated God yourself. Friends, here is hope for you and for me. It's possible. Our guilt can actually be forgiven. There's often some things in our lives that we recognize that we feel guilty about. Things we've done to, to other people. Uh, that person you put so much pressure on and where it led. The thing you've failed to do. It's possible to be forgiven. Uh, Jesus is willing to forgive so much that even this sinner with the greatest reputation in town comes in and he's and she knows she'll be forgiven. He said, I've come to seek and to save the lost. I've come to call sinners to repentance. You might be thinking, they're saying, I'm too bad for Jesus. Like if he, if he really knew what I'd done, if he knew the depths of my guilt, I can't forgive myself. So how could God forgive me? You need to know her debt wasn't too great. She wasn't too bad. And God's love and God's forgiveness is so much greater than yours. You can't forgive yourself, but he can. And that's the forgiveness you need. The one who's been forgiven much loves much. That's the first thing you need to hear from Jesus. But the second thing is this. The one who is forgiven little loves little. He loves little. Here's the second thing. Look at verse 44. So after the parable Jesus tells, he then turns to Simon and the woman. Verse 44, Jesus turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman, Simon? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Do you understand what he's saying to Simon about Simon? The people who think they are good and think they need little forgiveness, love Jesus very little. It's like that person, right, who stinks, but they don't know that they stink. They can't smell their own smell. Simon's like that. He doesn't realize he needs the shower. Instead, in this patronizing way, he's really happy for the, you know, other people who need Jesus to come up and get some help, but he doesn't need him. But at the end of this story, who kind of stinks? Is it the woman or is it Simon? Simon might be a religious leader, but do you see his lack of love for Jesus exposed? His heart kind of played out in his actions. Jesus, the honored guest, Simon doesn't show him hospitality. He doesn't wash his feet. Simon doesn't show him affection. He doesn't greet him with a kiss. Simon doesn't honor him by anointing his head with oil. But this woman does all these things. And why is that the case for Simon? Well, it's because he thinks he's a good person who doesn't need to be forgiven much, and so he loves very little. Now, the last words in this story belong to Jesus, but they're kind of sandwiched between this critical question because this moment in the house, it's not just three people. Suddenly we realize at the end of the story there are actually other guests watching along like we have been this morning. And so this might be our question 
I hope this is your question as we've got to this point. Do you see how he finishes, verse 48? Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now Simon, he thought, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus did know. And he forgave her sins. Now, let's be clear. No prophet in the Bible ever forgave sins. Abraham prayed to God for Pharaoh to be forgiven for his sins and God forgave him. Moses prayed to God for God to forgive the Israelites and God forgave them. No prophet forgives sins. Only God. And Jesus turns to this woman and he says to her, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Friends, he's a prophet, and he's more than a prophet. He did what God alone can do. He forgave her sins. And so I want to ask you, will you listen to him? Even more, will you come to him and ask for the forgiveness of your sins? Now, if you've walked in this morning and you realize you love Jesus little. You might be a Christian. You might be exploring these things. You realize you love Jesus little. Take this time to see this woman, to understand Simon, and to listen to Jesus. Have you got too low a view of your own sins and the debt you owe to God? Keep coming to church. One of the things we do every week, as Ben led us in prayer this morning, is we actually recognize together we are sinners. We do that because we love to come to our God for forgiveness through Jesus. We love to go to him for forgiveness. And we love him. Those who know they've been forgiven much, love much. And that uh, small group of... Uh, Aussies and Iranians. My friend uh, Mariam was one of the women in the group. And she wrote an article about what it was like for her to go from growing up knowing Jesus as a prophet and liking him to actually becoming someone who loved him. Uh, she said, uh, she wrote this, she, she, so I'll say it in her words. I learned about God in an Islamic framework. This God never appealed to me. I found him irrelevant in my life. When I came to Australia, I heard about the God of the Bible the divinity of Jesus. The God of the Bible was so appealing. He was so interesting. I learned that Jesus Christ gave his own life away, showing the greatest possible love, even to those who killed him, and that through Jesus, God forgives our sins, cleanses the filth of our souls. He gives us a fruitful life now and an eternal life in the world to come. She finishes by saying, how can one refuse such a precious gift? How can anyone turn their back on the God who loved us and devoted his life for our well-being? My hope this morning is that if you've walked in thinking, Jesus is a prophet, or maybe he's a prophet, you're now at a point where you're willing to approach him and actually ask him for the forgiveness of your sins. I'm going to lead us in a prayer to say that to God now. I recognize some of us will be ready to pray that. Some of us will want to continue to explore that further over the coming weeks and at meeting Jesus. But wherever you're at now, I invite you to join us in prayer to God through Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus, your Son, God with us, Thank you that he welcomes sinners like us. Thank you that he died to forgive us and cleanse us. 
please forgive us. Forgive us the greatness of our sins. So that we might love you greatly. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. Now, if you've asked Jesus to forgive you, make sure you celebrate by telling someone. It's the most wonderful thing that's ever happened in your life. Um, But now we've also got a chance to ask some questions. Uh, So why don't we start, as Francis is unwinding that microphone, um, by turning to the person next to you, ask them, do you have a question? Or is there a question that occurred to you? Talk to each other for a couple of minutes, and then we'll either have some, you can text questions in, or we'll take some questions from the floor. So for a moment, turn and talk to the person next to you, and then we'll take some questions. Thank you, Josh. Um, Keep thinking about your questions and sending them through. So I'll go through the questions that's been sent through um, now. Um, Question one is, do you think Luke interviewed Simon the Pharisee, that he recorded his internal thoughts as well as what was said in the story of the Bible? What a great question. It's awesome we have that detail, don't we, about uh, what's happening in his own mind. Now, I, I don't know is the answer. So uh, it could be Luke interviewed Simon. So you see at the start of Luke's gospel, what he's done is he's taken a careful account from the people who were eyewitnesses. Hmm. So that's how he's written this down. Um, so your suggestion, did Luke could Luke have interviewed Simon? Yeah, that could have been it. Yeah. We don't know. Cool. Thanks, Josh. Um, why do you think the woman dared to come to Jesus did, he or, did she already know that Jesus can and will forgive her? Yeah, isn't it amazing the courage that she shows to walk into the room? Man, what a woman. She, I have nothing but admiration for her. Um, why does she do it? Such a risk. Well, I think she knew uh, something about Jesus in order to, to go in. Um, And I'm just flipping back in Luke. She might have heard the things that he'd already done. Like if you look back at some of the headings in bold in your Bible, like Luke chapter 5, Jesus meets a man with leprosy. So he's outcast from society. He's unclean. The leopard man says to Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reaches out and touches him, says, I am willing. So here he'd made one man who was unclean. There's another man who couldn't walk. He was paralyzed. His friends brought him to Jesus, lowering him through the roof publicly again. What did Jesus do for this man who couldn't walk? Well, he said to him, son, your sins are forgiven. And then when everyone was shocked, they're saying, who can forgive sins but God alone? He said, so that you may know that I have the authority to forgive sins. Get up, take your mat, walk out. And he did. So he, what she might have heard, hey, he forgave that man. She might have heard him speak about why he'd come. They'd come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. She might have seen him show mercy to a widow. She might have been there at Nain amongst the crowd, seeing him raise this boy to life, thinking, here is God come amongst us. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Josh. This kind of leads to um, another question uh, for us. So what if your sins are too great that it's difficult for yourself to forgive yourself? It's hard to forgive ourselves, isn't it? And often there's a, a few things that in particular we are conscious of. We think, I can never forgive myself. And we might even think, I should never forgive myself for that. And actually you live your life holding on to guilt and perhaps even punishing yourself for the things that you've done. There, there is something appropriate in recognizing how great our guilt can be and the right nature of our shame. Just to just pretend things didn't happen or to pretend the way we've lived has no consequences, doesn't honor God, it's not true to reality, doesn't love others. But one of the wonderful things that we see in this passage is that the love and mercy of God is greater by far 
that even our ability to show mercy to ourselves. Now, another thing here is that often forgiving yourself uh, is sort of besides the point in some ways. The debt you owe is not to yourself. The debt you owe is to the person that you've wronged and to the God that you've offended who loves dearly. So forgiveness isn't primarily something that you can ever give to yourself. You need to be forgiven by the people to whom you owe the debt, which is God and the people you've wronged. Now, the wonderful thing, I think, is that having received forgiveness from God uh, actually does lift and, and, and help us to understand that the guilt that we bear has been washed away. What we need so much is not to forgive ourselves, but to accept the, and trust in the forgiveness of God, knowing his overwhelming love has washed us clean by the death of his Son. And let that start to transform ourselves. So we let go. We accept that we're forgiven by God and we actually have a new standing with him. Uh, and if that's the case for you, um, the person that you might then need to go and seek forgiveness from, if you may think, you know, you've accepted God's forgiveness, is the person that you've wronged. Can you actually ask for their forgiveness? Can you make restitution? Yeah. I think that's the most important thing. I think you've helped answer as well, if we keep sinning, will God keep forgiving? Because you mentioned that God is it's everlasting, that forgiveness and that love. So to clarify, this is the next question, if we feel we love Jesus too little, um, where will be a good place to start with self-examination, confession, repentance, any tips on a place to look in the Bible and to help us identify and comprehend our own sin? That's great, yeah. We don't want to be the person who stinks and we don't know it. <laughs> so maybe you need a friend who can tell you... <laughs> A friend who can speak the truth. Um, uh, it's wonderful that uh, the Lord our God, he, he knows us. Uh, and uh, the words of God in the Bible are the great thing that helps us to see ourselves for who we are, smell ourselves for who we are. Um, and uh, so drawing near to God and hearing his word is the best way, I think, to truly understand ourselves. Let's do that prayerfully, do that with others. This is part of coming to church each week. The bit, being the people who love God greatly means being the people who also come to God humbly, seeking his forgiveness. Now, just as a practical thing, one of the things uh, I uh, am doing at the moment is um, when I pray, I first read through um, Colossians chapter 3, where we hear about the new life we have in Christ and what we're to put off, the sins of our old nature, and what we're to put on, the new life God's called us to in Jesus and so I spent a moment reflecting on one or two of those things. Think about how that's been lived out in my life. Seek God's forgiveness and ask for his mercy to change me. So you might have a practice like that. Another thing that's really helpful is being part of a small group at church. When you share about the things that are going on in your life honestly, and then you're able to pray for and encourage one another. Yeah. Cool. This might be... A last question. Um, so we saw in the story how the woman showed her love for God, uh, for Jesus with um, wiping her feet away with her tears and pouring the perfume on. So what does, for us, what does loving Jesus look like in our modern world? Great question. Yeah. Um, I think it's wonderful that this woman's response to Jesus is love and that's what Jesus highlights. Um, Jesus taught the great summary of the Old Testament is that we have to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and to love our neighbour as ourselves. Um, that's the life of love that we're called into when we're forgiven by Jesus. Uh, so when you ask the question, what does it look like to love like this woman's loved? It actually touches every part of your life. Your whole life is oriented towards God to love him. With everything you've got, all of your strengths, of your, your will, your affections, your thinking, what you love. It's the complete transformation of yourself. And so um, what does it look like? It looks like everything. It looks like absolutely everything. One of the ways that um, the Apostle Paul talks about it is that we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, one that's holy and pleasing to him. Our lives are devoted to him. 
Uh, there's nothing that's off the table. Um, so you might want to just reflect on, uh, I love God, but are there things I'm holding back from him? And that might be a place to helpfully start in your reflection. Um, and that should flow out into loving your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Josh. Um, we'll finish up with Q&A here. Did you want to pray before we, yeah, I'd love to pray. we finish up? Let's pray. Oh, there's one more question. Can we, is that all right, Francis? Uh, We've had a hand from the floor. Oh, yeah. I just yeah, to. Wanna... yeah, can we take this one more question and then we'll pray? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you, friend. Thank you, Helda. Appreciate your question. So you might not have been able to hear everything Helda articulated. It was very helpful. But the final question was, what would I do uh, if I appeared before Jesus on the last day and discovered that uh, he was not God but was a prophet? Or vice versa, if I discovered he was God as well. Um, that's a great question, Helda. I'd love to hear what you would say as well. <laughs> uh, and that's a question that's really personally important for me as a pastor and a preacher because I take responsibility for what I'm saying to you. It's very important for you as you listen because what you do with what you hear could matter for eternity. You have to, I think, as the Bible says, when you die, face God and give an account of your life. And so the question Hallad has asked touches each one of us the most significant way possible. So we need to consider this carefully. Um, and I, I think Hallad, um, the only thing I'll have to say at that point is, Jesus, I listened to what you said. <laughs> I trust you. Um, I think my, my confidence on that day uh, and my confidence as I speak to you doesn't rest in my own intelligence or my research uh, or my comparative studies. Um, I've tried to read the Quran. I've tried to listen to my Muslim friends well, uh, as I would want to listen to you and all others. Um, but I think my confidence comes from Jesus himself and the experience of listening to his words. I'm very much struck by his authority. Um, by the wonders that he did, uh, especially by the way that he died on the cross as he said he would, and uh, my confidence that he did in fact rise from the dead, as those witnesses said. And so I think on that last day, when I stand before Jesus, I'll have to say back to him, uh, please uh, accept me into your kingdom. I've listened to what you said. (laughs) I trust you. Um, Thank you for for forgiving my sins as well. Uh, and I think that's where I'll, that's the only place where I can stand is, is on his words and on his life. Yeah. Um, you might want to ask Holiday's question to each other after church because it's an excellent one. Um, on that last day, if you meet Jesus, uh, what would you say? <laughs> uh, what do you think he will say to you? Um, shall we pray? Let's pray. Our loving gracious, merciful Heavenly Father. Uh, You have been so kind to us to forgive us an unpayable debt by the life of your own dear Son. Help us today to seek the truth about him, to consider carefully what he says, that we might know you and please you in every way and love you greatly. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.